Great, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Joshua Meyer, Lead AI Scientist here at ABSCI. And today I'm really excited to welcome Hannes Stark from MIT and the Technical Institute of Munich. Hannes is an expert in bioinformatics and machine learning, and today he's going to tell us about Equibine, which is an extremely fast and, in my opinion, really exciting deep learning model he's developed to predict how drug-like molecules bind to specific protein targets. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. So if you have a question, please press the raised hand button at the bottom of the screen, and I'll come to you uh, in real time on audio. A pop-up will appear asking you to unmute, so you'll need to, to click that before we can hear you. Uh, and keep in mind that we are recording this for distribution on YouTube. So if you'd prefer to answer your question, uh, enter your question using the Q&A window with text, uh, that'll work as well. I'm happy to just ask the questions myself then. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over uh, to you, Hannes, uh, to hear about this great work. Perfect. Thank you for the great introduction. Yeah, and I want to stress again, feel free to interrupt me. Yeah, so the task we're tackling here, as Josh said, we want to find the structure in which a small molecule binds to a protein. But right, we're, we only have a, a 2D graph of the molecule as input, and we, we don't have a bounding box to which we're docking. We're considering the blind docking scenario here, where the, the molecule could bind to any sort of location. Uh, on the protein. Yeah, and then we want to predict the binding location. Yeah, and as we already discussed before, yeah, we I probably don't have to mention here as much in detail why this task is interesting. Probably you can tell me a lot more about that uh, actually than I can. But yeah, we know that the previous or the most methods that we use for, for docking for predicting the 3D structure in which a small molecule binds to a protein, they sample many positions, or, yeah, many possible candidate locations of the atoms of the ligand, and then they score them with some score function. And yeah, this can be quite time intensive if we have to sample many, many of these positions. And yeah, instead, Equibind, it's predicts the 3D structure, really gives you the coordinates just in a single forward pass. So we also don't have scores for our um, 3D coordinates or for our conformations that we produce in the end. We just have a prediction of a 3D structure, a single 3D structure. Yeah, and the way we do that, or the very high level overview, right? And to also mention the task again a little bit, is we, we have this 2D ligand and we have the receptor with the 3D structure. Again, we have no bounding box. We can, we're doing blind docking and the, the ligand could bind anywhere. And then what we actually do in the beginning to get an initial 3D structure for the ligand is we just choose a random RD kit conformal. And in the end, we will also use the, the bond length and the bond angles of this um, our decade conformer and equibind, it will only change the torsion angles of the, of the conformer. Because we assume that the bond lengths and bond angles are pretty, uh, pretty correct, so pretty accurate anyways, given the, uh, from the our decade conformer and the, how things or the, the, how the conformation really ends up being in the end that mostly depends on the torsion angles. Yeah, and then we want to predict, right, the 3D coordinates in which the small ligand binds to the protein. But then, how do we actually do it? Right, so here we have this, as we, we already said, the step where we generate the initial 3D conformer of our ligand. And then from like this transition right here, this is just a, a sketch now. I'm moving to the cartoon world uh, to be able to explain a little, a little easier with my drawings here. And what we have here is the molecular graph of the ligand given by, or well, a 3D graph of the ligand given by the, the atoms. And we connect each uh, atom with its neighbor depending on a radius around the um, around the atom. So, yeah, we have this uh, radius parameter, which is a hyperparameter. And if we were to set the radius higher, right, 
then this atom would also be connected to this atom and this and this. But now in the sketch, we uh, just have it in the radius cut off in such a way that it is very similar to the 2D molecular graph. Yeah, but for the for the protein, we encode it into a graph in the similar fashion, the 3D structure as well, where we have the alpha carbons. We only consider the alpha carbons, right? We only have the alpha carbons as nodes in our graph, and we connect them with a radius. Like if a certain at, uh, if another alpha carbon is in the radius of our first alpha carbon, then they are connected. And this way we end up with this uh, graph of the of the protein here as well. Okay, and then we have a graph neural network processing the both the ligand and another graph neural network with the other weights processing the receptor to produce a, a little bit changed coordinates. Well, here they look very similar in my cartoon world and they look the same, but yeah, we, we have a little bit changed coordinates after these EGNN layers because they transform the features and the coordinates of, the, um, of our graphs. And yeah, we how we or how this EGNN works is by well let me just say it is a message passing neural network where we where we have the distances as edge features so we look at the edges of the distances and we have some initial node features like the atom type or whether or not the atom is in a ring or whether or not the atom is um, in a six ring. Yeah, th features like this. And we also have features like a double bond, single bond, and so on. And for the receptor, we have features like the amino acid type for the nodes and so on. Yeah, and then we, we do message passing, meaning that we for example, if we look at these two nodes right now, or we look at this node right now, then we update its feature by first taking the features here and here and putting them through some NLP and ending up with new features. And we do the same for, for the features here and here, end up with some new features. And then we, we aggregate them with some permutation invariant function and end up with uh, our updated feature for this node. Yeah, and this message passing is done in this EGNN, but the EGNN also, it's called equivariant graph neural network. It also considers the coordinates, right? Every one of our atoms is associated with a coordinate and we change those coordinates after every single layer. And the way this is done, is uh, in an equivariant way, meaning that no matter where our initial location is, uh, where our initial, um, where our ligand is in the beginning, like if our ligand was here in the beginning um, and after our EGNN layer, we would end up with the, the ligand being like this or like this, this node or this edge being like this then we would still, if the ligand in the beginning was here, then we would still end up with the node switch to the side like that exactly in the same fashion. So we are independent of the initial location in, in terms of how we change the coordinates. Yeah, and that's why it's called equivariant. All right, but then what else are we doing here? We're not only having the message passing here inside of our, of our ligand graph and inside of our receptor graph, right? And this message passing, it always considers the distances. And this way we consider the, uh, the 3D geometry. But what we additionally do is we have message passing and after each EGNN layer, we pass messages from every single of our receptor atoms to our, um, to our ligand atoms with an attention mechanism, right? Because we don't know the number of atoms in each ligand in each receptor. Yeah, but these, uh, this message passing there, we do not consider like distances, right? Why, why not? 
because we want to be independent of the initial location of the of the ligand, right? If if our um, ligand in the beginning was here instead of up there, then the distance features would be different. And of course, we always want to make the same prediction, no matter where the ligand was in the beginning uh, of, our, of our model. So yeah, this way uh, we can still remain independent of our initial location. Okay, but now we have done this this first step, right? Which is nothing, nothing special. We did some message passing here, some message passing here, some message passing in between. We end up with updated features with updated coordinates. And now how do we actually bind or how do we now come up with our final 3D structure prediction? So what we do there is we construct key points for the receptor and key points for the ligand. And the, let's first say how the key points for the receptor are constructed. And these key points are supposed to somehow capture the location of the binding site, like the location of the sites where the ligand interacts with the receptor. Okay, and now if we do this for the, um, the get the key points for the receptor, the first thing we do is we take the mean of all of the features in our ligand. Okay, then we end up with a single with a single vector. Let's draw it over here. And this vector we use as a query in an attention mechanism where the keys and the values all come from our receptor atoms. Okay, so each single uh, each single node of our receptor gives us a key and a value. But the key comes from the feature of the receptor and the value is actually the coordinate. So what do we more or less do with our, um, with our keys, right? With the keys that come from the features of the receptor, we calculate an uh, attention distribution over every single atom. And this attention distribution, we apply to the coordinates of the uh, of the atoms and then we end up with some yeah like a an interpolation between all of the coordinates and maybe we our query told us to pay a lot of attention to um, let me take this color our query told us to pay a lot of attention to this coordinate and uh, also a little bit to this almost no attention to all of the other coordinates. So the coordinate that we will finally end up with is over here maybe. Right? Because we also had some attention to the coordinates over here, but only very little. Okay, and we, we can do that again, right? Because we maybe don't just produce a single theory. We, we take the yeah, we can have multi-head attention and can have as many queries as we want. So in practice, we use something like 30 of the, these key points. But now let me just draw three, um, or no, let me draw five, four key points. So then we maybe have another key point coming from another tension head here, another key point here, and maybe the fourth key point ends up being here. Yeah, and then we again do the same thing for the for the ligand, just the other way around, and then we end up with key points that are maybe maybe a key point is here, maybe a key point is is here, and one key point is here, and the last one is here. Okay, and then the, um, the final thing that we do is to yeah now. We, we have these key points for the ligand and for the receptor. And what we do now is to find the translation and rotation that moves the key points of the ligand as close as possible to the key points of the receptor in terms of RMSD. And that can be done with the Kupsch algorithm. Right? And so this Kupsch algorithm, right, let me do it like this. It just takes the uh, takes the, these key points and the key points we have down below, and 
it spits us out the rotation and translation that we need to apply to the green point cloud to have it end up as close as possible in terms of RMSD to the red point cloud. Yeah, and after we've done that, we just apply the same rotation and translation to the ligand coordinates and they end up maybe uh, hopefully perfectly in the binding pocket. Yeah, and that is the, that is the key of the um, mechanism or the key of the model, because this way, right, we're completely independent of the initial location of the, of the ligand, because no matter where the ligand is in the beginning, the, the, the key points will always be constructed in the same position relative to the ligand. So yeah, then, then the rotation and translation calculated by the catch algorithm will always move the ligand into the right spot. So if there are any questions about that, please go ahead. It's, this is the key mechanism. It's maybe also a little uh, complicated, so we can spend some time on that. But otherwise, um, I, can all, I would also summarize it again a little bit in this figure here. Right in the beginning, we have our ligand with the feature or not with the coordinates of each node and features for each node. Similar for the receptor, we have some coordinates for each node and features f dash for each node. We put them through this message inter message passing and intra message passing, where the inter. Um, no, where the intra messages, so the messages that only happen in here and only in here, they have distances and the other ones don't. We end up with our transformed point cloud, transformed features, transformed point cloud for the receptor and transformed features. And then we construct the key points here, Y and Y dash, the key points from the, um, yeah, from those transformed coordinates and and those key points give us the rotation and translation that we need to apply to the ligand to have it end up in its final location. Yeah, but then, and um, didn't you say there's also a torsion angle degree of freedom in the ligand as well? How is that incorporated into the, into the key points? From your explanation, it seems like the key points would be rigidly attached to the ligand structure. Yeah, so let's get into that, right? We have our transformed point cloud here. And from this transformed point cloud, we construct the key points. So this, but this transformed point cloud, which originally came from our, uh, from our ligand, this is actually can be very janky. Let me go maybe here. It, it can look like this, for example. It doesn't necessarily have to look like a realistic molecule. So, um, yeah, we, we this is only basically used for constructing the key points, right? The key points here that we use to get the rotation and translation. But then the um, the step where we get the final conformer of the ligand and yeah, because we don't just use this point cloud here, right? That can look very unrealistic, have unrealistic bond lengths and bond angles. The, the way we get the final conformation of the ligand, that is actually with um, by taking these transformed coordinates and then changing the original ligand with the realistic bond lengths and bond angles by only changing its, its torsion angles to fit this transformed point cloud as closely as possible. And that's how we end up with the final uh, conformation that we then actually put into the pocket with the rotation and translation. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is to, to solve the problem of this point cloud not looking very, um, and not being realistic, right? not realistic bond lengths and bond, ang bond angles. And we do that by taking the realistic, or well, yeah, realistic bond lengths and bond angles, and then only changing the torsion angles to match this point cloud as closely as possible. 
Yeah, and in our paper, we call that a fast point cloud fitting. So um, I have a follow up based on that as well. Mm -hmm. um, how important is that step? So for example, if you were to take some of these key points and like add noise on top of them, does do you expect the method would still work? Like how important is it to predict this exactly right? Um, so, so you mean the key points or do you mean the conformation that we... Uh, actually, let, let's say both. Yeah, so um, I think if you were to add noise to the, the key points, it's maybe rather robust to it because the, right, the key points, um, if we maybe go back to our drawing here, like this. Say our key points were moved a little bit in each direction. And then probably the and then probably the rotation and translation that we need to apply to put it as close as possible to the um, to the key points of the receptor, this rotation and translation probably doesn't even change that much. So I think this would be rather robust to, to some noise. But for the um, for the uh, point cloud here, the Z point cloud, was, which gives us the final conformer of the ligand, there I think we need to get it rather well because um, if we otherwise say this, maybe these two points, if they are like over here and over here, then the torsion angle of this um, this bond would be very different. And maybe this ring over here would be rotated like this instead, and we would end up with the wrong confirmation. That, that would be my intuition. Okay, okay. that's really helpful. There's a, another question also someone uh, uh, slacked me, which is about like flexible docking. Um, so actually I have, I have a question on this also. Uh, when you look at this, independent SC3 covariant graph matching network input for the receptor is X prime and output is Z prime, right? So that means you are actually changing the coordinates. In yes, practice, yes. when you run this method, how, how much flexibility do you see happening? Because this is basically flexible docking, right? You're allowing your, your small molecule and your protein to, to change. Is that mm -hmm. right or no? Sorry, this might have been a little bit confusing. In the end, we only use the changed coordinates, the Z dash, and the, yeah, the, the Z dash, we only use to construct the key points. Um, yeah, the, these key points over here, the Y dash. And the, in the final bound confirmation, we use the original X dash. But, okay, so we- I see, the, okay. The, so that means that there's no, okay, so you don't get any gradients basically on the rest of the coordinates, right? So you're getting the Z prime, it's three by M and you're just changing it, taking a couple of the coordinates there in order to construct your key points. Is that right? Well, you are getting some gradients because right this, you're getting the gradients of the key points that you constructed, which are interpolations of the coordinates of the, of the receptor. And those coordinates of the receptor are the Z, Z dash. Okay. That makes sense. And why why can't we take the yeah right why can't we take the z dash and do flexible docking well let's go back to this drawing and say we have a um, we have a ligand that binds to the receptor over here right. and then our point cloud um, the the key points that we construct right they are only able to lie within the convex hull of our um, receptor mm -hmm. because we use this uh, attention mechanism over the coordinates. So they are only able to lie in here. Oops, let me take another color. Uh, the, the key points are only able to lie in, in here. Yeah, and so our, if we had a, a ligand, that is like this, uh, that binds over here, then we have to have our EGNN transform the, uh, let me remove this guy. And then we need our EGNN 
to transform the ligand uh, to, to transform the receptor oops that did not work <laughs> to transform the receptor that in the end some of its coordinates at least are up here right so we can we then have our convex hull like this and can actually end up with p points that are in here and we can place our ligand over here i'm not sure if that's entirely uh, clear but um so, so that makes sense for this method. I wonder if you have any thoughts of the uh, future of, of like flexible docking in this context. Like what do you see are the key things that need to happen in order to enable flexible docking? Yeah, so to, to addition, additionally have receptor flexibility, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll take the freedom to only answer this in terms of the equibind model. Right. Because there we could also imagine to, to have something like uh, an additional EGNN where one is just, um, yeah, the purpose of one is just to change the, the coordinates to obtain uh, um, the key points. And the job of the other EGNN is to come up with a Z, um, Z dash dash, which are then the final coordinates of the receptor in which we put the, the the ligand yeah so this for example would be one one idea to, to get the flexibility there but yeah i mean this is not now not a very uh, general statement right of what what needs to happen to get receptor flexibility working in machine learning models or in graph neural networks operating on uh, operating on um, 3D structures of, of receptors. But I think one large part is maybe really just better 3D encoders for proteins, right? We have, for example, seen this GearNet paper this year come out, or there's also the intrinsic, extrinsic convolution paper to encode 3D structures of GNNs better. But yeah, we always see that it's the gains that we get by these more complicated models to encode 3D structures. They aren't, I don't want to dismiss the work they did, but they aren't maybe so relevant compared to what you can get with an EGNM. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. There's, there's one more question from the chat before I move on from Yi that says, uh, wondering if key points can be viewed as, pharmaco as uh, pharmacophores, in other words, geometrically depicted charges distribution. Um, let me get to, uh, to that point a little bit later when I explain an additional point of how we try to come up with physically plausible uh, key points that should somehow represent binding locations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But then let's uh, finally have a look at some last images for, for this step here, uh, where we go from this janky point cloud that is not necessarily a realistic molecule to our final ligand conformation that we then put into the receptor pocket. Yeah. And here we just have a few images of the Z point cloud and then how the ligand looks like if we take realistic bond angles and bond lengths and only change the torsion angles to fit this point cloud as well as possible. Yeah. Uh, but then we also have an additional reg regularization step in our EGNN, right? We have this EGNN, which changes the coordinates of the ligand. And we actually don't want it to uh, produce these, oops, produce these janky ligands. And they could be even much more janky if we didn't have this, um, this additional soft regularization step. And I, I sort of imagine it like a batch norm where you, after every EGNN layer, you still want to keep your, this time not features, but you still want to keep your um, coordinates in a reasonable in a reasonable distance to the next bond, uh, to the next atom and so on. Yeah, and what we have there is this term right here, where we have some distances 
in the original point cloud. And we have some distances after an EGNN layer. And we say that we want these distances to be similar. And which are these distances? Well, they are our one hop distances. Now we're talking about the molecular graph, not the 3D graph, okay? And there are the two hop distances in the molecular graph. And they are all of the distances that are in an aromatic ring. Okay, and why do we choose these one hop and two hop distances in our molecular graph and say we want them to be preserved? Well, that is because the one hop distances and the two hop distances, if they are not changed, then the bond angles and the, uh, the bond lengths are not changed, right? Uh, only we're only allowing the model to change three hop distances and all other distances because we only want the model to change torsion angles right if we were to keep uh, three hop distances fixed as well so one two three hop then we would not be able to change the torsion angle here right if if we were to rotate this atom to over here now our oxygen is here, but then this distance would have would have changed as well. And, and that's why we have this term. But then how do we actually, we, we now have this term, which is sort of a lost term, right? But how do we actually preserve it? Well, we take the gradient with respect to our um, produced point cloud and we update our produced point cloud with a few gradient descent steps to match this constraint more closely. And down here, we just have a visualization for one molecule, which sort of distances or the distances of which edges would be preserved. And we, we want to preserve, but this is a soft regularization, right? Okay, and then we also have an additional a term in our, um, uh, this is just an additional term in, in the very end, if we end up with our final ligand location prediction here, and we have our, our receptor over here, then we want, you know, we sort of put Gaussians around each atom of the ligand, each atom of the receptor, and we say we want a little overlap. Let's say if there's large overlap like over here, then we have a large additional loss term, which we call intersection loss. And we can provide some more details if you're interested in that at the end. Yeah, but then we had the question from, from G or Yi about how or what the, the, the key points might correspond to. And what we do there is we have the, key, the concept of key points and pocket points. So what are pocket points now? Well, we say that uh, if we have, or we say we define these pocket points now, first of all. Now, let's say we take the, um, the, the atoms that are on the outside of the of our ligand. Well, let me only consider these four for now, and then we look at the distance, or yeah, we look at the line to the closest receptor atom, which is maybe over here for this this ligand atom, and then we look at the um, the line between them, and we define the middle of this line and this color maybe we define the middle of this line to be a pocket point okay and this way we end up with all of these pocket points uh, but let me now draw a fifth one okay so let's now consider this uh, that we only have five pocket points in this situation well maybe let's say six because then yeah, this would be a plausible configuration that we might end up with. And these pocket points, we say we want the key points that we produce to be close to these pocket points on, let me say, on average, right? Because the key points that we're producing, 
Yeah, we always have a fixed number. We always have four for every single ligand and every single receptor. While if we have a very large, um, a very large ligand, then we have way more pocket points because we have way more points of interaction between the ligand and the receptor. So what we use is an optimal transport loss between the coordinates of the key points and the coordinates of the pocket points. And then maybe the lowest possible optimal transport loss here would be achieved by having an optimal uh, a ligand key point, uh, a, a key point that ends up over here. And maybe a key point here, one here, here, and here. And sort of the key point, the, the first that we drew, this is assigned to these two pocket points, right? With the optimal transport loss, where we have a mass preserving loss between the um, pocket points and the key points, and they don't, do not have to have the same cardinality. Okay, so in the end, we can say that we have this additional optimal transport loss term to make our key points correspond to interaction points between the ligand and receptor. Assuming that we actually capture interaction points with this pocket point construction, where we look at the um, outer atoms of the ligand and the closest atom of the receptor to those outer atoms of the ligand and interpolate between those two. Okay, well then we have everything together. This are the, the main components of Equibind, or well, these are, then let's test Equibind and for that, yeah, we use PDB bind and we take all of the structures that were released in 2019 or earlier as our training data and all of the structures from 2020 or later we use as test data. Well, not actually, we also remove all of the data. Uh, we also remove all of the complexes that have a shared ligand from the test data. And uh, we also consider the test scenario where we have no shared ligands and no shared receptors as well. Okay. And then when we test our, um, our equibind like this, we compare it against some baselines, which are SMINA. Uh, oh, oh, first of all, all, all of these baselines we use this standard paradigm paradigm, right? Where we sample many different locations, we score them, and then we choose the best scoring um, locations based on the, the scoring function. But for this, we really need a good scoring functions. And these methods have different ones and diff different sampling schemes as well. And for example, Gnina down here, this has a deep learning based scoring function with some 3D CNN. Yeah, but then we also use some commer commercial software. And so we, for example, also use Quickviner, uh, Quickviner W, which is made for white bounding boxes. So for, um, for, for blind docking as well. And we compare these against Equibind. And in our comparisons, I will always show curves like this. Yeah. And here in this curves on the x-axis, we have the RMSD of the ligands where we put it and where it's actually crystallized, like yeah, where, it, where its actual location is in the co-crystallized structure. And just quick question about that. Does that mean you're doing, you're taking the molecule in the correct conformation in the correct position and doing like captured, uh Ligand mm -hmm. RMSD. So, how are you oh. computing ligand RMSD here? We are um, only we are computing ligand RMSD here, if you call it that. So, we do don't do a capture alignment first and then calculate the RMSD. We just take where we put the ligand and where the co-crystallized ligand is, and then we calculate the calculate the RMSD. Yeah. So that means the position doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter where you placed it. It just matters that you predicted the conformation correctly. Is that right? 
it does matter, right? We do not do a Kapsch alignment and then predict uh, and then take the RMSD. So what we do is we take the co-crystallized location, which is maybe now over here in space, and we take the location where we put the ligand, so this is maybe over here, and then we take the RMSD between those two. And then receptor is fixed between them? Yeah, the receptor is maybe around the, um, the co-crystallized ligand and maybe the predicted uh, ligand is over here and then maybe the receptors somewhere here. And we do not okay. consider like the receptor, right? We cannot get wrong, so to say, because we don't move it. Yeah, okay, perfect. That answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for the clarification. Um, but this is what we have on the x-axis, right? And on the y-axis, we have the fraction of predictions which have a lower RMSD than what we have on the x-axis, right? So let's say we have a curve going like this, then we would know here at this location from, from this point of the curve, we would know that 60% of our predictions have an RMSD that is better than 10. And so th these are how to interpret these plots. And so the best curve would look something like this. Yeah. Oh, well, of course it would look like this, but yeah, you get the point. And, but then before we actually look at those curves, let's first of all, look a little bit at the run times of our models, because so here, what we're showing in this table, oops, is so first of all the four baselines that we're considering, right? And here we have the average time that it takes a model in seconds to make pr a prediction for a single complex in our um, in our test set, and this is without any receptor pre-processing, right? Because in, in practice, the receptor pre-processing you would only do once and then you would, or in many applications, you would only do it once and then you would dock many, um, many ligands to, uh, to it. Yeah, and then we can look at the time that Equibind takes. And this is really an order of uh, orders of magnitude faster. Also, of course, if we use a GPU, which you usually would do, I suppose, then you're even faster. But yeah, then we can also look at these plots over here. And what we see is in the, in the area of like if above five angstrom error, above five angstrom linked RMSD, Equibind is already doing a lot better than the baselines. But in this low, uh, below two angstrom RMSD region, their equibind is not doing as well as the baselines. So we see that equibind is very good at getting the approximate location right, but then the final exact coordinates of the um, receptor uh, of the ligand are not found that accurately. And that sort of makes sense, right? If you have a if you're able to predict, or if you're able to have many, many tries of where you put the individual atoms now in the very end, um, like the, all of these baselines do, then you're probably much better at finding the exact final locations of the atom, instead of doing the equibind approach where you just put the ligand immediately into, uh, you just make your final prediction in one shot. Yeah. So what we then do, right? Equivine is good at getting the approximate location. We then you try to use Equibind together with one of those classical methods to fine tune like this initial prediction of Equibind further. And this way we end up with numbers like these. If we look at this table over here, maybe, right? Now we're no longer, if we use Q Viner for fine tuning, for example, or Smina for fine tuning, we're no longer as, fa as fast because we do this additional sampling always, but we can actually still be quite a bit faster than the, um, than the fastest baseline while having better 
um, better numbers. Yeah, better numbers. And yeah, in, in terms of a curve or these curves, this would then look like the light blue line over here. So we can really get a good trade-off between runtime versus accuracy, how you can decide which level of this you want to have. But finally, I want to look at some, some visualizations because uh, Patrick Walters, or Pat Walters, as he's probably known, he, from the Relay Therapeutics, he sent us this tyrosine, tyrosine kinase and said, this is a challenging target. Uh, we should try this challenging target. He thinks we won't be able to, to dock to uh, two drugs to it. And because I, I suppose many other docking or this was a hard target for most docking, um, docking schemes or docking tools. Yeah, and he sent it so, to us. So this is sort of is not cherry picked, but still it's only a single example. But yeah, uh, let's, let's see what this is about. Right? We have this tyrosine kinase here the protein, and we have two different drugs in green. So these are two different molecules. And these two different drugs, they bind well to this location and that location. And this, these are the ground truth location that we would want our models to predict the ligands to be in, in the two different ligands. Yeah, but if we look at the predictions that Gnainer makes for these, it puts both ligands into the same pockets. Uh, so one prediction is pretty good, uh, where the ligand should actually be, but the, the other one is completely wrong, right? Because the gray one, it should be, should be up here. And similar, if we look at the pre predictions of Smina, they are both in the other pocket. So again, one is wrong and um, yeah, one is completely wrong. Then we can look at the predictions of Glide. <laughs> And it actually swaps the two, um, two ligands around. So it puts both in the completely wrong positions. Yeah, then we can look at Equibind S, or the so Equibind with minor fine tuning. And there we see where Equibind is able to put the ligand in the correct approximate location. And then with fine tuning, we, um, with minor, we almost get the perfect confirmation in the end. Yeah. And I don't want to forget to mention that these examples are not in the training data of the model. Yeah, and with this, I would be um, very happy to, to take any questions. And I hope you now uh, are convinced by, yeah, that Equibind um, is capable of making even real world or taking these real world examples of a, of a tyrosine kinase and two specific drugs and binding to it and docking them in, in the right locations while the baselines are. So I'm happy about any further questions. Well, first of all, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, this was presented really well. All those graphics were very helpful for uh, better understanding the method uh, and the results. So thanks again. Um, so a couple of, of questions. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is really cool. You just brought up a point at the end about how this isn't in the training set. I'm wondering how you assess generalization in this space. We do mostly, you know, protein-protein interactions at Absci, uh, designing antibody drugs. But curious, when you're doing uh, protein small molecules, how do you do like generalization? Are there like structural holdouts? Are you doing that on the receptor side or the small molecule side? Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, so on the molecule side, right, we could do a scaffold split where we take, um, where we only consider molecules in our test sets that have a very different scaffold than the ones in the train set. But we do actually not do this with Equipment, right? We only have this time based split, which we hope reflects reality. Um, and additionally, make sure that there's no receptor and link, ligand overlap but we do not have a scaffold split, for example. We also do not have a sequence similarity split, for example, on the side of the receptor. What would you actually say is, would be the most 
um, convincing for you in terms of the, the protein and splitting the protein, would you say uh, which it would be the most convincing if we maybe have a sequence similarity split or somehow take structurally different receptors or structurally different binding pockets? Yeah, I think it would be the, the latter, right? So uh, let's say you're working on a drug discovery project and then you've got some target where you don't have any small molecules that bind to it and you're trying to make a small molecule drug for it. So that is maybe a receptor that looks different from other ones you've had before, because otherwise people are using like homology modeling and things like that in order to find some initial lead small molecules, uh, initial hits, and then they can optimize them. So it would be, again, I'm not an expert in small molecules, but it could be really interesting if you had like that structural holdout. So you had proteins in a test set that are very different from any proteins you've seen before in terms of their structure, because it's a structure-based method and showing if you could generalize uh, to that. Yeah, and yeah, right. Uh, also the, what I said, maybe with the structural different binding pockets, maybe doesn't even make that much sense. And we really just want structurally different proteins, right? Because we're considering blind stopping here where we don't right. have a pocket and we, the, the molecule could just find to everywhere on the on the receptor. Yeah, but again, it depends what the problem is. I think like you, there's already a lot of value here if you can, especially with like the fine tuning with the uh, existing methods. Like if you just evaluate the same kind of benchmark, right? Like it's it's still very useful. Like even for those kind of homology modeling stuff, right? Like you can do things faster here, um, so it's still uh, you know it could be very impactful. I hope so. Um... Yeah, this is actually something that uh, Regina now is also uh, my future supervisor, Regina Vasle. Um, she's very interested now in this, how well these models, these 3D models generalize. And my hypothesis sort of is that the all of these sequence-based models will not generalize as well as the structure-based models, because if we, consider or if we force the, the, the model to consider the structure and maybe the distances between some atoms, then we bring it much more closer to reason about the underlying physics or we increase the probability of the model actually reasoning about the underlying physics. And if it actually ends up doing that, well, then we're able to generalize because the underlying physics is how things really happen. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. Um, yeah, what, what is, so what is next in this line of work? Uh, next are affinity predictions, I would say, because right, we don't only or often not only want a 3D structure, but it would also be nice to have an affinity value if we just want to, if we have something of which we do not know whether or not it binds. And well, this is, what we most often, I would assume, have in practice, right? Where we have a receptor and we want to discover some drug candidates that might bind to it, inhibit it. And then, yeah, we want this, this affinity score when we search through our library of a billion different molecules to find the, um, any other, uh, to, to find the ligand that binds to it. Yeah, no other yeah. questions in the chat, I suppose. Well, I have, I still have one more question here, which is uh, you're talking about uh, binding affinity, right? Like what kind of data are you going to use in order to predict the affinity of, of the ligand to the receptor? Uh, so there when PDB bind, right? We also have the, um, we also have the affinity scores for every single complex, right? And then we have these, yeah complexes so which are only molecules that do dock right then we would additionally need some data of which we uh, know that they do not uh, bind but yeah okay great we have one minute left and there's one more question from the chat uh from bob which who asks uh yeah. might adding a fourth dimension time improve the possibilities for affinity predictions because molecules can wiggle yeah. I'm very happy about this question, but um, maybe the, the minute is not so very sufficient. But the thing I, I will say is if you have some, or what I'm very interested in that space are diffusion models, 
where we uh, do know a DALI 2, for example, which uses diffusion to generate some, some images. And we also have models like GeoDiff, which use diffusion to generate the 3D structures of a molecule only given its 2D molecular graph. And we do basically diffusion, denoising on the coordinates of the molecule. And what if we now like put a point cloud into the binding pocket of a protein and then do diffusion on the, on the coordinates of the atoms that we put into the pocket and then yeah, we diffuse it denoise it to finally end up with a molecule that fits into the pocket very well. And I think this is almost like modeling the physics because we can then reason about the distances and yeah, we can have the, what your score model does, right, is almost predict forces that are applied to, that you then have to apply to each uh, atom. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we're at time. Uh, really, thank you again for, for coming to give a seminar. I think this was uh, really enjoyable. A bunch of thanks from the chat as well. Um, yeah, I, it was great learning more about this work. Uh, I have to echo the very enjoyable and thanks for the nice questions. Also, the nice questions from the chat.